that everything that everything that everything that has breath praise the Lord let everything that everything that let everything that has breath praise the Lord Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the soul. If they could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never cease to praise. Let everything that, everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens, join him with the angels, praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now, join with creation. Calling all the nations to your praise If we could see how much your worth Your power, your might, your endless love Then surely we would never cease to praise Let everything that, everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you. Uh, I'm tired. Some of you saw we did four miles this morning over in Eleanor, and uh, that catches up with me pretty soon. So we got some coffee down here, going to keep me awake during sermon. Uh, oh, by the way, if I don't know you, Pastor David, thanks for coming. It's Pastor Andrew Gordon, Pastor Mark Tool, standing up back here running our show. And we're glad that you're here. Uh, Meredith, our children's ministry coordinator, is upstairs with your kids. Uh, and if you'd like your preschool kids and children's church kids to go up, we can take care of those as well. Uh, but just glad you're here. I hope if you're new to us, you will fill out a response card. There's some on the back table. There's also some on our website. Uh, you can turn those in electronically. We've got a couple of things that we're integrating back, getting back into our normal routine, as normal as we can. Uh, the Ladies Bible Fellowship class began today at 10 o'clock in room 200, so ladies, you're welcome to join them. They're doing a study of the book of Exodus. Uh, men's are starting a Philippian study next week on in room 212 or 211, excuse me, uh, so get involved in that. Operation Christmas Child, some of you have asked, will we participate? Yes, it just has to be a little bit different. We do have some boxes in the back, but you can get those instructions to do them online, and we encourage you to do that to participate uh, there. The uh, deadline is November 22nd, so that's going to be upon us pretty quickly. Um, baby dedication. This is one of my favorite services of the year. That's when I'll be back in the pulpit in a couple of weeks. I'll miss you for the next few weeks. I've got some obligations uh, militarily, uh, but I'll be back at the November 22nd. And we will be doing baby dedication. So please make sure you get signed up if you'd like to dedicate your children. 
this will be the culmination of the stewardship series as I get to speak on stewarding family, my favorite topic to talk about. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, giving, you can see behind me, you've got your opportunities. We are grateful that you have been faithful stewards. Again, we could explain how this whole path began with our electronic giving uh, a while back, but uh, the Lord prepared us for the pandemic and prepared us for the changes we need to make. So thank you for your faithful stewardship. Our church is doing well financially, and it's because of that. So we appreciate that. Okay, a couple of things uh, before I jump to prayer requests. We are having communion at the end of the service, a very special time to observe the Lord's table. That box in the back has uh, all your communion supplies if you want to slip out if you didn't get it during the song. And obviously online, uh, if you want to follow the instructions and, and prepare yours as well, you can. Again, that will be at the end of the service. A couple of special things I'll share with you. Um, special thank you from the Dotsons, Beth, uh, and her family since this and the passing of her father. Uh, thank you seems so inadequate for everything you've done for our family. Uh, we appreciate the calls, text messages, food, flowers, and most of all your prayers. Such a blessing to have a church family who truly cares. And, and this is that body. Uh, it really is. I get to talk about it over at our service at 1300 today. I'll be speaking about how powerful uh, the love of the body of Christ is. And I always look forward to that. Okay. A couple of continued prayer requests. Continue to remember Debbie Loudermilk and her radiation treatments and Connie Jeremias with her chemo. Uh, the Jeremiah's were very, very thankful as we took up that money, as you remember, to sell the flags, uh, took up your contributions and sent them to them for her financial uh, needs, and they were very thankful for that, so they send their thanks. Continue to remember Kenny Haddix. He uh, back up to Cleveland this week for some follow-ups, and then the Harper family asked us to thank you as well uh, for your prayers and cards following Gail's passing, so we appreciate that. How about your unspoken needs? We have those, obviously, our unsaved friends and family. And the testimony we want to pray for today is uh, some, um, some more special missionaries. Kirk and uh, Susanna Shafley are our missionaries out in Wind River, Wyoming. Say that really fast three times. Uh, and we've had the privilege. It's been a while since we've been out there. But my wife and I and, and a couple other folks took some teenagers and went out and spent some time with Kurt. Again, it's, these, these things have been part of my personal uh, walk with Christ. And so these, these people have very special meanings to me. So remember Kurt uh, Shafley and his ministry out there in Wyoming as, as we pray this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, it is a gift to have life breath today, to enjoy it in your creation, and, and most importantly in your body, the body of Christ. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that brings us together, brings us here to worship you. And we're thankful for all those who were submissive to getting out of bed this morning to come and be a part of it. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, you will nourish our hearts with your word. Uh, we're looking forward to, to learning more about how to steward the message today. Thank you for Pastor Andrew. Thank you for your guidance and, and direction that you've given him this week. Uh, bless his words as he shares them with us this morning. Uh, we pray for those who are on our list, Debbie and Connie, uh, as well as the families who have experienced recent passings. Uh, just um, thank you for the privilege of coming alongside and and being able to grieve with those who grieve uh, so that we can do it as those with hope and not without. And so thank you for that. Uh, as we go into our service, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, who's not saved, who can't say if they take their last breath today, they'll spend eternity in heaven. I pray that they'll consider their lost condition and understand that they are loved by the God of creation, and this will be the day of their salvation. Now, God, we pray that you bless Kurt and the ministry. Uh, Wind River, Wyoming, we thank you for that ministry, and we just pray that you continue to bless him with your strength and endurance as he continues there. So now, God, uh, just speak through your word today. Move us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand again. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you 
God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God, oh, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, oh, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. All right, you may be seated. For God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he was suffering. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. It is also good to see almost every chair grouping is full today. So uh, glad to have you with us uh, this morning. I'm excited to continue the series that we started last week. And last week when we kicked it off, it's a stewardship series, which many people think immediately they're going to start talking about money. And that's a big part of stewardship, isn't it? Uh, is stewarding our money. Uh, but stewardship is so much more than that. And the big idea last week was that everything about your life is a gift from God to be stewarded for His glory. And we talked about how that starts with creation in Genesis chapter 1, that we were created in the image of God to bring Him glory, to fill the earth and, and subdue it, to bring God's rule and order to every aspect of life, whether it's creation itself and working the ground and bringing forth fruit, whether it is it was uh, government and different ways, societies we live in, the cities we live in, the families that we live in. 
the order of God reflecting his image over the whole earth, and that we would find true blessing and true satisfaction if we found our obedience in him alone. So we talked about that last week, and that was, that was the point. But the problem was Genesis 3 happened just two chapters later. We ruined it. We blew it. Man stopped reflecting God and God alone and his, his interests and his image and turned to self-interest. And it brought about brokenness and sin and lack of trust. And it started from a lack of faith in God by Adam and Eve. It eroded their faith, and it turned to self-interest and greed and pride, and that's why we have sin. And we talked about the fact that sin against the God who created everything, it brings about the punishment of wrath. The wrath of, of God upon sin was due to come to us. But God did not just start over, wipe everybody out, and start over with us. Or with somebody new, not with us. He sent his son Jesus to be the perfect image bearer. And not just to bear the image of God, but to bear our sins on our behalf on the cross. And that Jesus Christ gave us new life now. And that new life is to be stewarded for his glory. And if that's the overarching theme, and that's the overarching kind of framework that we can look at all of our lives through, the question we're left with then is, so if I am supposed to steward my life for his glory, my new life for his glory, how do I do that? Where do I start? And so today, the big idea is that the highest priority in Christian stewardship is disciple making. If you want to know where to start, the highest priority in Christian stewardship is disciple making. And most of you probably are nodding your head yes, like, yeah, I believe that disciple making is the number one job of the church. Well, today I want to invite you not only to think of it as the one, number one job for the church, but the number one job for individual Christians. So please turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read verses 16 through 20. And when you get there, please stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. This is the word of the Lord. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, we're asking for you to illuminate it for us so we understand it. Father, we ask that you would apply it to our hearts through your Holy Spirit, that you would make us more faithful in the number one job that you've given us, which is to make disciples. Father, I pray that you would give clarity and uh, freedom within this hour to hear your word and to obey it. We pray that you would be glorified with the result. Lord, we pray that the gospel would rest heavy on all of our hearts, but especially those who may not know you, who need to put their faith in you for the first time today. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so we're picking up at the very end of the story. The very end of the story, which is Matthew 28. It's the last record that Matthew has in his gospel. And there's a setting like any story. And there's lots of neat uh, opportunities uh, to look at the different settings, uh, different things about the setting. But we don't have time for all of them today. So I want to go straight to the audience. And the audience setting, I uh, want to know who Jesus is talking to. And if you notice, it's the 11 disciples. We know that, uh, that uh, Jesus... Uh, was betrayed by Judas, and Judas has already gone to his death at this point. And so the 11 disciples show up, and what, it says two things about them. It says that they worshipped him. Now, I don't think that it's too strange to, know, to hear that the disciples worshipped God, worshipped Jesus. Why? Well, because Jesus had just done what nobody else has ever done. He predicted his death, and then he predicted his resurrection, and then he pulled it off. Now, if somebody tells you that they are the Son of God and that they've got a prophecy for you, and then not only does the beginning of the prophecy take place, he dies, but the end of the prophecy also takes place, he raises from the dead, 
then every claim that he ever made about himself has to be true. He has to be the son of God. God would not honor that type of prediction if it wasn't true. So Jesus proves he is who he says he is by raising again from the dead. So that makes pretty good sense that Jesus that the disciples would be worshiping. But then he says some doubted. Now I don't know about you, but when I hear the word worship and doubted, it kind of strikes me as strange. He says that some of them doubted. And maybe for some of you, you go, wait a minute. No, worship is supposed to be wholehearted by faith. It's supposed to be genuine and sincere, and you should be wholeheartedly worshiping God. And yeah, that would be great. But it says here that some of the disciples doubted. Something really interesting, it struck me as well, because I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? And I did some more study and found that uh, the Greek language has a word for doubt that's used in almost every place in Scripture. And, and it means this, to have a divided mind, and, to, and it, it erodes faith. It's, it's, the, the, it's the thing that's prohibited in James chapter 1, when James says that you should pray with faith and never doubt. That's bad. Sin, sinful doubting, and it's bad. It's wrong. But here, Matthew uses a word which means more to hesitate or to waver. And the only other place in Scripture that it's used is by Matthew himself when Peter is walking on the water. Do you remember that story? Jesus is walking to them on the water, and Peter says, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out. Now, if you were a ghost or you were playing a trick on Peter, wouldn't you have been like, come on, Peter? So I, I, if that was me, I would, I would have been maybe not as enthusiastic as Peter. I would have been wavering in the boat, okay? But Peter gets out, and he walks out, and, and you notice he believes that it is truly Jesus. And he gets out of the boat. He says, this is Jesus. And he starts walking towards him, but what happens? He gets distracted by the waves, and he starts to sink. And Jesus picks him up, and he says, O ye of little faith, why have you doubted? But it's this word for doubted. Why did you waver? He's not rebuking Peter. Peter got out of the boat. The other 11, they were in the boat. But then he says, they all worshipped Jesus when he got into the boat. So I think that it's, that it's pretty relevant that the only other time this word is used is in the same context. It's, there's, it's not that he didn't believe Jesus was who he says he was, but he got distracted. He said, Jesus, you are who you say you are, but this wave is big. How many of you go, yeah, that's about how I come into worship every Sunday. I believe God is who he says he is. I believe in Jesus. But you know what? I see the things that are going on in the world, and I see the things that are trying my faith. And yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I've wavered a little bit this week. I've been like, I don't know if I can get out of the boat. Now, I have a lot in common with the 11 disciples who believe in Jesus, but at times waver. And I think we all do to some degree. And I want to bring that out about our text today because it's to these wavering worshipers that Jesus gives the greatest command of all time. So let's look at the text. There's three main points in this sermon, but the main point is right in the middle. That's the meat of it. That's where we're going to spend the most of our time. But there's these two statements that sandwich Jesus' command. And the first statement is the king's credentials. The king's credentials. He says, here's why you should believe in me. And what does the text say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, anybody, your parents ever told you to do something? Your boss ever told you to do something? They say, why should I do that? And they said, because I said so. And they're leaning upon their authority, the authority that, and the respect that they believe is due them from you. Now, Jesus does not give the disciples a chance to say, why should we do that? He says, because I said so. I, the king of the universe, the one with all authority and on heaven and on earth. And if Jesus Christ, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, says all authority, reminds you of his authority, the next thing he says is the most important thing that he's going to say. And that leads us to the king's command. The king's command, make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of of all nations. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. Disciple making is the number one job of the image bearers of Christ who seek to steward for the king the life that, they've, that he's given them. Disciple is a word that means learner. It means student. Now, for, for me, when I think of being a student, I'm a seminary student. So right now, that means turning on the computer and watching a video of a lecture, and I'm learning information. 
That's what a student does. But disciple literally means a learner more like an apprentice. So uh, if you've ever been in a science class that had a science class and then a science lab, or you've ever been in a, in a class that had hands-on application, a practical section, that's what being a disciple is. Being a disciple is somebody who learns the information, yes, but then is, learns how to do it, not just what the, the discipler says. And so the students of Jesus, the disciples, they were called to learn about Jesus, learn his teachings, follow him, and then to tell others how to follow him. See, a disciple wanted to be like his master, and then he wanted to pass his tradition on to others who would then also become like his master. This is the command. The command is to make disciples of all nations. But what about the method? There's three aspects of the method. The first one is go. You've got to go. Now, um, I hesitate with this because uh, I want to use, uh, sometimes want to use the language tools. There's a Greek, in the Greek, it's, it, it's really interesting. And I want to pause for a minute and tell you, if you read from your English translations, you can trust them. And if anybody ever goes to the original Greek and says something that's different than what you understand to be true, it's probably not right. So I'm telling you this not because I have some secret information that you don't have, but the deeper you go, sometimes you can pull out some things that are like, oh, that's, that's interesting, and it might help me to understand it better. Here in the passage, it's not just a verb, go. In the passage, it's this word that if you put it all together, it says, while you are going. While you are going, make disciples. Here's why that's important. Have you ever... Uh, been kids, we'll start with the kids. You ever been sitting watching TV and your parent says, hey, while you're cleaning your room, you need to take out the trash. You know, I'm not cleaning my room. What do you mean cleaning my room? What they're suggesting there is a command. While you're cleaning your room, which means what? It means go clean your room. That's what Jesus says. Hey, while you're going, make disciples. Well, I didn't even, I didn't, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to go. And while you're going, make disciples. Here's the point. All of us are going somewhere in life. Even if you don't go very far every day, even if you're learning or working from home, you are going in that you are living life and it is around people. It's a, it's you, every aspect of your day is an opportunity to bring God glory. And what Jesus is saying is in your going, you need to make disciples. Take advantage of those opportunities to take the gospel to people. And we're to go to all nations. Now, I've gone on several missions trips. I've gone overseas. Several of you have. But I've never been to all nations. And I don't believe that this side of the grave, I'm going to get anywhere close to having gone to all nations. But we as a church, and we as individuals need to make sure we're part of a church that cares about this mission of going to all nations. And that starts with where you're going in your daily life and where we are planted in this community and being involved in the community, being involved in what God's doing in our state, in our nation, and around the world. Our goal is to be a part of God's community of people, taking the gospel to all nations because we have the most important message that people need to hear. Our number one job is to make disciples, and we should be doing that in our going. Well, the next part of this, he says make disciples. He gives this in two parts. Making disciples has two parts. He talks about, first of all, baptize them. How do you make disciples of all nations? Well, first, we need converts. We need people who would believe in the gospel. When, when Jesus says disciple-making, sometimes we say discipleship, we split it up. We say here's evangelism and here's discipleship. When Jesus says make disciples, he says you got to bring them in. They need to believe in the gospel, but then they need to learn how to follow me and make more disciples. And it's all one category. But the first part of that is baptism. The first part of that is we need to see converts. Now, baptism is the symbol, the public profession of faith, the entry point into the people of God. Baptism doesn't save you, but what baptism does is it declares to the world, I'm a follower of Jesus now. And this shows that I'm dying to my old self and I'm changing direction. I've been raised to walk in newness of life. My sins have been washed away and now I am following Jesus. So he says, baptize them. We as God's people need to be people who are sharing the gospel so that people get into the kingdom. But then next, he says, teach them to obey the commands of Jesus. 
teach them to obey the commands of Jesus. If you would have asked me when I was you know, growing up, what is the Great Commission? And then like every good Awana person, I could spout out a verse for you. And, uh, but I used to get it wrong. Here's what I used to say. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that I have commanded you. But the Great Commission is not teach them all of my commands. It's teach them how to obey all of my commands. See, discipleship is not merely giving you information. We've got a lot of people in this room this morning, and I can teach you a lot of things, but discipleship is the process of taking those things and learning how to obey them. It's moving forward. The responsibility of Christians does not stop with sharing our faith. The responsibility of Christians continues by sharing our walk of faith, sharing how to live and how to follow the commands of Jesus. Colossians 3.16 says that we need to let the message about Christ in its richness fill, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Here's the point of this verse. If the word of God is dwelling in us, if we're learning it, it should bring us to be able to teach it and to counsel. Think about teaching as this is what's happening when we're, when we're sharing information. But counsel, that's the lab section of the class. That's where we say this is how you apply it in your individual life, in the problems that you're facing, in the challenges that you have. Counseling is how do we do it. And all of us as Christians need to be building up, uh, getting in the word and letting that flow out of us so that we can walk in wisdom. Wisdom is not simply knowing what to do, but it's how to do it and actually obeying it. And that's what Colossians 3.16 is teaching us. So how do you make discipleship the most important part of your life as a believer? How do you do it? Well, if we've talked about the fact that discipleship is moving from baptism to the end, we move it to the end of our Christian life where we're one day going to be like Jesus and and we're going to be exactly how we're we're created to be, How how does this move forward in our lives? Well, the first step you need to take is to know where you stand in your own discipleship, in your own walk with the Lord. So my question to you is, are you saved today? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Because this process hasn't started, but God wants to, he wants to save you, he wants to change you, and he wants to use you for his glory. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, that his death and his resurrection provide forgiveness for your sins, if you've never done that, if you've never declared that Jesus is your Lord, then you can today accept the free gift of salvation by putting your trust in him and just asking for forgiveness. You can do that. Now, if you're a Christian, you've, you've done that, and you are seeking to follow the Lord, are you baptized? We put such an emphasis in the Baptist church about the fact that baptism doesn't save you that we forget the fact that that's the first command that God gives for Christians. Now, I've used this analogy before, and it gets you guys in trouble because I get some of you in trouble. But last week, I did not have my wedding band, and it bothered me to no end. I was, like, I felt myself playing with my ring finger while I was preaching, which is probably something I shouldn't be doing anyway. Uh, But I'm like, man, I don't have my wedding ring because my ring chipped, and it cut my finger, and I had to send it in to get a new one. And so... For three days before I bought this silicone one as a placeholder for my, for my new one, I was walking around with no wedding ring, and my wife was not at home. Like, she was not in the state. So not only did the first day after she leaves, I'm, I, I, I break my wedding ring, but I can't wear it. Yeah, yeah, super convenient. Thank you for that. All right. You're senior pastor, everyone. Rubbing it in. Anyway, so I've got it today. But this wedding ring did not marry me. I was not unmarried for three days last weekend. And that didn't happen. But it's the symbol of whose I am. Not anybody else except for Chelsea. That's the symbol. And for me, I want to wear it. I bought this one. I spent extra money to get one so that I wouldn't go ringless for a month. Because it's important to me. Not because... I believe that it has any power over marriage, you know, by the power invested me by this ring made by whoever. It has nothing to do with it. Baptism is the same way. Now, some of you are like, well, I can't wear a ring because of my job or this, that, and the other thing. Okay, that's not the point. 
baptism isn't one of those things. Baptism is that command to say, if, if you won't make that public profession of faith before the people of God, in, in, in symbolizing dying to sin and raised to walk in newness of life, why would, you, why would, why would, why would we or, or, or you even believe that you would do anything else to be committed to Christ? If you want to know God's will for your life and you're saved and you're not baptized, baptism, that's God's will for your life. I can promise you that. I, that's the next step. But those of you who are baptized, are you walking with the Lord regularly? And are you bearing fruit? Hopefully you're reading the word of God. Hopefully you're praying. Hopefully you make evangelism a part of your daily life. That's part of growing in our faith. Hopefully you're serving in the church in some way. But fruit is the fruit in your lives that makes you different. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that God works in our lives. This is what Paul says in Colossians chapter uh, one, in his prayer for his peop- for the people at the church. He says, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will, so knowledge, and give you spiritual wisdom, that's application and understanding, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. If we can say one thing about disciple making from the pulpit, it'd be this. Me talking to you this morning is not necessarily disciple making. It's preaching and it's important, but actually coming alongside of each other and pushing one another to bear fruit and be the people God's called us to be in your going, in your life, in your daily walk, those are the things that God has called you to be and to be growing and being more Christ-like in every aspect of your life. So are you walking with the Lord regularly and are you... Uh, are you bearing fruit? The next step to growing in your discipleship is to look around. Look around. God did not put you where he put you on accident. You may think, no, it was on accident. In fact, it was a car accident that made me meet that record driver or that, uh, that body shop owner. Or I don't know why I, I met this person or talked to this person or had this business deal or this meeting or whatever or why my kids did this. No, God put you in every aspect of your life for a reason. So look around, because that's part of your going, and God wants to use that in your life. That's not to say that every staff meeting you have, or every business meeting you have, or every checkout lane interaction uh, at the store needs to be a full-blown gospel conversation, but it does mean that we are going to try to reflect Christ in every one of those opportunities. And in order to look around, the next step is you need to be prepared. Always be prepared. We should be praying because I don't think about my interactions, my accidental interactions, my, the, the coincidences of life, so to speak. I don't always look at those with the, same, uh, with the same stewardship. So I need to be constantly praying, Lord, here's what I think I'm going to do today. Here's my calendar. Now you mess it up. You, you do what you need to do. But Lord, help every interaction that I have to be thinking about. How can I reflect Jesus in the way I do business, in the way I interact in society, in the way that I talk, things that I post, uh, in the people that I'm around and the places that I go? So we need to be ready at all times, and that preparation only comes from prayer. Next, invite people to go with you. Invite people to go with you. Are there people in your life that you need to, and it, it's not always a one-way discipleship thing. Sometimes it's getting with people who are trying to go in the same direction, and it's iron sharpening iron. You don't just have to find a disciple, you know, uh, although that, that would be good. If you have children in your home, guess where your discipleship is? This is God's will for your life. They're your disciples. <laughs> if you have an unbelieving spouse or, or, or people in your life, those are the types of people that you need to be, uh, you need to be witnessing to. But who are people that you can invite to go with you? Not just the spiritual things in life. Discipleship is teaching people how to read God's word, how to pray, how to serve in church, how to share their faith. That is discipleship. But discipleship doesn't stop there. We heard in our last series, in Titus chapter 2 specifically, that discipleship is older men and older women teaching younger men and younger women how to do life as Christ followers. That's discipleship. Who are the people you're bringing into your life to help do the everyday things for the glory of God. Romans 15, 14, Paul sums up his letter by saying this to the people, not to the pastors, but to the church. 
I'm fully convinced, dear brothers and sisters, that you're full of goodness. You know these things so well that you can teach each other about them. Who are the people in your life that you can talk about the Bible to? If you're to a point where you're like, I don't know if I can talk about the Bible with anybody. We need, that's the first step because we need to be in the word and we need to be growing in that way. But who are the people around you? Well, that's the bulk. That's the main point today. The big point is the king's command. If you're going to steward what the king gives you, you need to obey his first and most important command after becoming saved, and that is to make disciples. But I said it was sandwiched with these two comments. The first comment is all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So in other words, you need to listen and obey the next thing that comes out of my mouth. But then he ends it with the king's comfort. The king's comfort. What I just told you today, what I just preached today, that's a daunting task. Because some of you are like, disciple making, that's for the church. Yay, here's what I'll do. I'll give to the church. I'll show up. I'll do some things. But I just said that it's all of our jobs. And we want to equip you to do that better as individuals. But it's a daunting task. Some of you are wavering worshipers like the 11 disciples. And here's the promise that comes with the command. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You remember when we talked last week about the, command, the blessing that God gives is in the form of a command? Jesus gives his command, and then he gives the blessing. The blessed context. He says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, if you go and make disciples, that's where you'll have my presence. In Acts 1.8, he words it this way. He says, maybe, if I can get there, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. When what happens? When my Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and around Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. God, Jesus g gives us his presence. The context for the presence of Jesus is most highlighted in the work of disciple making. And so you could take comfort today if you came in today and you're a wavering worshiper, you can take comfort today knowing that I need to be a disciple maker. And that's a slow, long process depending on who you're discipling and who's in your life. And those things are difficult and that's daunting. That's tiring. That's exhausting. But the Lord promises, I am with you in that lifestyle. So last week, everything you've been given is a gift from God to steward for his glory. You're to bear his image and sh display his glory all over, all over creation. Bring his rule, his order, and live in a way that, that honors him. But that job was made harder through sin, but not impossible because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so we've been given new life today, and we've been given a new job. And that new job is to make disciples of all nations. That job comes from the king himself. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, but it comes with this blessed promise, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So our inv invitation today is fairly simple. Are you a disciple today? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you said his work and his death alone is enough to save me? His blood on the cross brings about my forgiveness. Have you put your faith in him alone for salvation? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead and you declare that he is Lord? If not, we'd love to talk to you today. The next question, though, is when you evaluate your life, are you stewarding your life situation for the miss mission? Are you stewarding your life situation for the mission? You know, many of us don't look, about, look at our jobs, our commute even, the people we talk to, the people we come in contact with as opportunities Opportunities to point people to Jesus. If you are, what are some of those details? What are some of those things that God is using in your life? If not, how can he use those things? Next, who are the people that God has put in your life to disciple? Who are the people that God has put in your life to disciple? I said earlier, if you're a parent, your kids. If you're married, your spouse. That's a mutual discipleship opportunity there. If you are in a workplace or you work around people, live around people, come in contact with people, who are your people? And guess what? You're going to find discipleship, people to disciple and disciple you here in the church. That's the goal. 
is hopefully you're building relationships in such a way where you're growing. But who are some of those people? Write them down and, and actually look at that list and then answer question number four. What can you specifically do to invite people to go with you? We can't live this life. We can't follow Jesus on our own without help. First and foremost, we can't do it without the help of the Holy Spirit. But we also can't do it without the body of Christ that he's put us into. And that's what he's called us to do and to be a part of. So who can you invite to go with you? The love of Christ compels us. It constrains us. It propels us forward to live for Jesus. You won't follow the obey, the obey you will not follow and obey the commands of Jesus if you aren't driven by God's selfless love for you through Jesus Christ on the cross. And we have the opportunity this, this morning to practice communion. One of the most important reminders that we have of what Jesus has done for us and what he calls us to take to the nations. In communion, we have a regular reminder that he gave his body and his blood so that we can be forgiven. When we take it, it's a message. It's a message to us. It's a message to those around us that he gave his life for us. And it's, a, and it's an opportunity for us to recommit to living our life for him. Communion is another outward symbol. Like baptism is the entry point, communion is that regular meal, that regular nourishment, that as Paul says, every time you take this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim my death until I come. Your death? Yes, my death. That all of this is meaningless if you don't have me. But this is the offering of forgiveness. Communion doesn't save you or keep you saved but it's that regular practice of, uh, of, of the forgiveness that we get because of Jesus Christ. And we remember that the power that we have to make disciples comes from him alone. Now, for believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul is talking about communion, there's some problems in the church. There's some people abusing their power and their privilege, and there's disunity in the church. And so believers, if you have something against someone in the church or someone in the church you think has something against you, Paul says you've got to get that cleared up because otherwise you're taking of communion unworthily. If you are in open, willful, unrepentant sin and you come to the table and say, thanks for my forgiveness, Jesus, you're not taking communion with the right heart. So in a minute, we're going to have an opportunity. Our invitation song is going to double as our communion contemplation. And we want to give you the opportunity, if there's somebody in the room you need to go talk to, or if there's, somebody, if there's business that you need to do with God. You don't get right with God before he saves you. He saves you, makes you right with God. But this is the time. This is the time to, to say, I'm turning from this way of sin, and I want to give this outward sign of, of my repentance and my change. If you're not a believer in Christ, we want this to be a sign to you. We're proclaiming the death of Jesus because that is our only hope. We've got nothing if we don't have Jesus. We've got nothing if we don't have Jesus and we deserve eternal punishment forever without God. Punishment, punishment because we've rebelled against a holy God. But what we're going to take in a minute is, a, is an announcement to you that that's not the final story and that you can put your faith in Jesus Christ today. You can believe in him for the first time. And we'll baptize you as soon as we can, <laughs> safely, and, and we'll, make it, we'll make it happen. And so this table might not be for you today, but it can be, and we want it to be. And so during this invitation, come talk to one of us if you have questions about the gospel. I'm going to pray, and then, then the team is going to, uh, is going to have this song of contemplation. We'll come back up and take, uh, take communion together. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the stewardship of taking your message to the ends of the earth. God, I pray that you would help us as we, we seek to follow in that command. May we never forget that our nourishment and our power and our salvation and our grace and the message itself comes because of your goodness and kindness to us. And so as we think about the table, we approach the table, we ask for your help. Help us to remember 
Help us to partake, not in any worthiness that we have, but because of the worthiness you bestow on us through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is the body. This is the blood. Broken and poured out for all of us. And in this communion, we share in his love. This is the body. This is the blood. I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted the sacrifice that set me free. Well, I hunger and thirst for your love. Come fill me. This is the blood Broken and poured out For all of us and In this communion We share in his love This is the body this is the blood. Well, I will remember everything, Lord, that you've done for me. I won't take for granted the sacrifice that set me free. I hunger and thirst for your love. Come fill me today. This is the body. This is the blood. Broken and poured out for all of us. In this communion, we share it. This is the body, this is the blood. We hunger and for your love, your righteousness, yeah. we long for your presence, yeah, Lord, be with us again, cause this is the body, this is the blood, broken and poured out. Sharing his love. This is the body. This is the blood. This is the body. This is the blood. This is the body. This is the blood. There's no unawkward way to transition into this, so I'm going to make it awkward. <laughs> the best way to take the, to use these is only a second time using them. To save ourselves a mess in a minute, uh, there's a top cellophane to 
take off first, because if you take off the other one, then you won't be able to get to your bread. But let's take a minute and do that now so we can get the rustling out of the way uh, before we, before we uh, look to the scriptures. Just like in the upper room, right? Let's pray the Lord's blessing as Jesus did that first communion. Lord, we thank you for your body that was crushed and broken for us. We thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf. Father, that we can have the forgiveness of sins. That we could be made right with you. And that we could have the hope of eternal life. Father, we thank you for and ask that you would bless this part of our service. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, He took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. The next thing they did in the upper room was they sang a hymn, and then they went out to a garden. I don't have a garden for you, but we are going to sing. So please stand with us. And then after we sing, leave Eric. Yeah. 
by grace draw near and bless your name. Well, a month passed quickly. As you know or remember, October was uh, Pastor Appreciation Month, and I hope you found ways during the month to show your pastors how much you appreciate the work they do and the commitment they have. As a church, uh, we found monetary gifts are one very good way. So this morning we have some monetary gifts for our pastors. If you'll come up. Mark doesn't want his. Okay. <laughs> Pastor David, Pastor Andrew, Pastor Mark, we just want you to know how much we appreciate what you're doing. I know I'm violating all kinds of rules here. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> we do appreciate you. Let's show them how much we appreciate them with a hand, please. <laughs> you know, it's been a tough year, and... They've been there for us in guiding and directing and researching and finding ways to get things done in this pandemic period. And it hadn't been easy. There have been a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, head work and hard work. So we really appreciate what they've done for us. So thank you again. All right. We're so appreciative of our pastors. All right, so that concludes our service today. Let's all bow as we say prayer and uh, dismiss. Loving, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for once again just allowing us to be in your house. What a beautiful, beautiful crowd we had this morning. Both services, Father God, we're so grateful for all who made their way out. Those that joined us online this morning. Father, our prayer this morning is that we are those disciples that you've called us to be. Help us, Father, to go out to make more disciples and to show people the cross of Calvary, to show Jesus the love that you shed on all of us, Father God. Help us, Lord God, to go out and, and do that. Lord, we pray for those that, that weren't here, that weren't able to be here for whatever their, their ailments are, the sick and afflicted, or those that are still trying to stay safe and stay home. But most of all, Father God, if there's one among us, one within our voices this morning that, that, that are close enough to hear us, Lord, that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, we pray, Father, that you move in their heart before it's too late. Help them, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Folks, if you don't mind, your chairs where you're sitting, if you would, uh, stack the chairs five high, please. Those of you that are, are still out there, thank you so much.